seems to me, Mrs. Oren, that perhaps you have a particular liking for these, uh, well, uh, controversial subjects. It's true that in the social studies, there are many differences. 1972, the year of the Hughes! We're doing presidential elections for you guys. Five minutes, six minutes, cooked up nice and fresh. Maybe if you're a political science student in college and you don't know what the hell is going on, you're in an AP government course and you're like, oh my God, the test is coming up. Um, these are just really broad-based lectures to get you in the game. It's not to be able to write a paper. You're not going to do your dissertation for watching this, that's for sure. All right, giddy up. Let's get to it. 1972, we've seen 60 and 64 go to the Democrats. 68 is back in the red, it's back for the Republicans, and it's 1972. So a couple things about 72. You should know Richard Nixon is running for re-election. Um, we can see up on the wall George McGovern, who is going to be um, running, I believe, South Dakota. He was from um, running for presidency as the Democrat. So we want to explain why. Watch me watch the map. You ready? Look at the electoral map. Ah! If you're a Democrat, you just scream like that. Yeah! If you're a Republican, you just screamed like that. It's a blowout! Richard Nixon got his wish. All right, there's some really big ideas about this election, so we're, I'm going to try to give it simple, then. Um, first of all, demographically, why it's a blowout is for the same reason 64 was a blowout. Just switch it up. It's opposite. In 64, we saw the Republicans nominate kind of a really right side of the uh, fence kind of guy in Barry Goldwater. Well, now the hippies get their wish. They nominate George McGovern, who's completely anti-war. He even talks about, like, drug legalization. He's, like, off the farm on some mainstream issues. And I know that even though in populism a lot of people might support some of those things, in mainstream politics it's really an alienation device. So, basically, that's why Richard Nixon's going to win. It's going to be a blowout election because Richard Nixon, number one, is ending the Vietnam War through Vietnamization, but nevertheless, he's wrapping it up. His foreign policy is kind of kicking butt, going to China, detente with the Soviet Union. Um, the economy is, is kind of chugging along. It's not doing great. It's not doing bad. But generally, if you have a decent economy, foreign policy is looking better, um, and you're a sitting president, you're probably going to win. But... You know, you really should know about Watergate. I can't stick Watergate in the middle of this, but Nixon really wanted to win really bad. Let's just put it that way. He had a group of advisors called the Creeps, the Committee to Re-Elect the President. Gordon Liddy is one of them. He's still on the radio, that guy. A couple other guys I can name, but basically ex-Cubans from the Bay of Pigs. Howard Hunt's involved. It's like there's conspiratorial people out there right now that are like shaking, like ah, la, 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 la. But nevertheless, um, they, they basically are helping Richard Nixon get reelected. And whether he ordered it or not, they definitely broke into the Watergate Hotel. They definitely bugged the phones of the DNC. They definitely went back when the bug got, uh, was broken. They definitely got caught. Woodstein and Bernstein definitely dug up the story. Um, also that lady, Leslie, from 60 Minutes. But nevertheless, they had the um, you know, deep throat who's feeding them information, this ex kind of Navy Secret Service guy. It's just crazy. And at the end of the day, when Congress catches wind that you know something's going on with Nixon and is there a cover-up? Did he know about this burglary? Did these guys work for him? Who paid them? It's just like a crazy story, guys. Um, but at the end of the day, when, um, you know, uh, when uh, uh, Dean, uh, John Dean kind of, goes in front of Congress. I think he testified for like nine hours. He basically spilled his guts about the whole thing. And then when Congress now is really getting interested in kind of like the next steps, maybe impeachment, you know, getting closer to Nixon with his story, um, they find out that there's tapes and then, you know, Nixon has all these tapes where there's basically evidence, there's smoking guns of him basically at least gauging in the in the cover-up of, 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 of the Watergate break-in. But uh, he kind of, you know, has this kind of grand kind of vision of executive power. And instead of burning the tapes and having a marshmallow toast, uh, he waits for the summons and then it goes to the Supreme Court, him ignoring the summons to turn, subpoena, I'm sorry, to turn over the tapes and eventually gets shut out in the Supreme Court and uh, he's got to resign in disgrace. And then Gerald Ford kind of pops in. So we're not going to talk about Gerald Ford until 1976, but... Man, I got sidetracked by Watergate. McGovern, right? Hippie, leftist, tie-dye, crazy guy. Not really, but that's how the media is going to kind of portray it, and that's how kind of textbooks portray it in the sense that he's too far to the left. 
um, to get elected. And the silent majority is going to rise once again, and they're going to sweep the land, except for like Massachusetts and Washington, D.C., which wouldn't vote for a Republican if you lit them on fire. Unless you're Scott Brown, gotcha. All right, we're out of here. Leave this room and don't come back until you're ready to apologize to me. It's a long way to the end of the term. When will this end?